wow, I had a return audience. This, this is good. OK. So yesterday, we talked about the theory of market design. We talked about the design of school choice mechanisms from a bunch of different directions. And then we talked about other applications you know, for a very brief moment at the end. It was mostly a survey talk, and it was sort of predominantly an expository style. We didn't go into too much technical detail. Today, as I promised, we're going to do something that's a little bit different. So again, this is going to be a survey. But it's going to be a little bit more technical, because what we're going to do is we're going to go through a single research topic. We're going to follow this entire set of papers that have been written mostly in the last three years about trying to understand what all of this matching theory has to say about affirmative action. So the talk, again, is going to be in three parts. We're going to talk about quotas, and then a, sort of a, a more clever form of quotas called minority reserves. And then at the very end, I'll talk about some work that I've been doing very recently with Typhoon Sunmez that sort of generalizes all of this and lets you also embed things like financial aid options. And it's called matching with slot-specific priorities. And it will become clear once we get there where that terminology is coming from. But first, I just want to bring you back into the setting of school choice so you can remember where we were. And these slides are going to look familiar. So the story. Centralized assignment of K through 12 public school students. And the students are the strategic agents. So the schools have these completely exogenous priorities. And so it's the students, by which we really mean their parents, who are playing in the mechanisms. The seats are good. Students only want one of them. And again, the mechanism is going to allocate students to seats via some centralized system. So we talked about this, and, and we should review it because it came up a couple of times yesterday. What's going on is parents are mailing preferences in, and then the school system is running a single centralized algorithm. And they might be running the student optimal stable mechanism. They might be running the Boston mechanism. They might be doing something else. But that's the story. So the parents go through a stage in which they know something about their priorities. And they might not know the random tiebreakers that are used to fully flesh out the priorities, but they know whether they live in the walk zone or not, or whether their student is of a particular type the school is trying to attract. And they submit their preferences. The mechanism outputs an assignment. OK, notation. I is going to be the set of students. C is the set of schools. Students have linear preference rankings over the schools. Schools have these linear priority rankings and total capacities. A match is going to specify the assignment of students to schools, and we care that the match respects capacities. Again, this is all review. Hopefully, this is just reminding you where we left off at the, or I guess where we started the school choice discussion yesterday. And these were our design goals, our basic goals. So leaving aside this school competition, we talked about strategy proofness. We talked about elimination of justified envy. We talked about Pareto efficiency. We saw that these are sort of in conflict with each other. And we also had this respective improvements criterion. OK. Last thing, we ended this discussion on school choice with this piece of bad news. Yeah. Could you remind me the definition of stability in this setting? Yeah. So the basic definition of stability in this setting is right here. So if you envy someone else, so if you wish you could have the school they're assigned to, mu of j, then they must have a higher priority at mu of j than you. OK? And in fact, there's, there's sort of an additional component, I suppose, which is also that that school had better not have open seats. Right? So if you want to move to a school that has open seats, you should just be allowed to move. So we'd better assign you to the best school you can have that has capacity to hold you. And then we're not going to let you trade at all with students, or if you want to trade, it has to be ruled out by the, stu the student's priorities. OK? Stability, everyone OK? We'll see three more slides that have definitions of stability on them today. So we'll have the opportunity to think about this again. But we'll see what stability looks like when you add different types of affirmative action constructions on top of the model. OK. And we ended with this story, where at least for a, a particular stylized model, no mechanism that we see used a lot, so neither the student optimal stable mechanism, which we like for a lot of reasons, or this Boston mechanism, which is used 
you know, still in many places, although not nearly as many as it was before, none of them actually enable any choice for the students in the bad neighborhoods. You get stuck in the bad neighborhoods, and even top trading cycles, while it allows the students in the good neighborhoods to trade around, they still keep all of the bad students in the bad, or students in the bad neighborhood in the bad neighborhood. So that's where we start thinking about other interventions. And so today, we're going to learn what matching theory has to say about these other interventions. You know, if we want to do something that's going to explicitly favor students of some type, what can we do and what will it look like and what does it do to the stable outcomes? Can we do it in a way that's strategy proof? Leaving aside, I suppose, the possibility that people might move to a bad neighborhood in order to get the bad neighborhood priority. What can we do with this problem? OK, so now, as I said, we have three different parts. We're going to start with this quota component. But before we get into the technical detail, I want us to get on the same page about what affirmative action is. So I went and looked up some definitions. So affirmative action refers to positive steps aimed at increasing the inclusion of historically excluded groups in employment, education, that's our focus today, and business. They are intended to promote access for traditionally underrepresented through heightened outreach and efforts at inclusion. OK? So we're trying to, this is, we're getting the students from the bad neighborhoods or who've otherwise been underrepresented, you know, low socioeconomic status, they're going to be the big one throughout most of the talk, and we're trying to promote access to them. So strategy proofness is a way to give them access to the mechanism, but if the mechanism itself is not something that's going to move them, you need to do something else, and that's going to be affirmative action. Uh, as an aside, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, a nice neutral account, uh, points out that affirmative action often generates intense controversy. There's been a little bit of controversy about this over time. Pompeii was also buried by a little lava. And because I really thought it would be fun to put Ron Paul on the board in front of Stephen, you know, here's some of the controversy. You know. James Webb, you know, 40 years ago, as the United States experienced the civil rights movement, the United States experienced the civil rights movement. After a full generation, a plethora of government-enforced diversity policies have marginalized many white workers. The civil Rights Act of 1964 gave the federal government unprecedented power. This is Ron Paul as the one opposition vote in the, uh, the act to commemorate the 40-year anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The result was a massive violation of the rights of private property and contract, which are the bedrocks of free society. Aren't we glad we have that, uh, that to know? OK. Uh, you game, <laughs> no, 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 for sure. So there, there's clearly some repeated game. Uh, there's, there's, there's very serious repeated game stuff going on here, no question. But nevertheless, it's a great quote to pull out. And they do have it actually with about that much context on his website and his commentaries on affirmative action. I tried to only legitimately quote politicians who were legitimately opposed to this stuff. But the bottom line is there's a lot of disagreement about whether affirmative action is a good idea, but there's not very much disagreement about what it's actually supposed to do or what it's doing. Right? You know, both of these guys are, are opposed. What they're opposed to is taking seats from people who they think really should have them and giving them to people who they think haven't earned them. OK, so fact. The popular majority quota based systems where you set a quota for the majority students and say you can't have more than this number of the majorities at the school actually don't work. So it's not necessarily the case that they will benefit all the minority students. They might in fact hurt all of the minorities. And moreover, they may be Pareto inferior to the solution without majority quotas. So they might hurt all the majorities and all the minorities. So we have people being very upset you know, because they feel like these slots are being given to the minorities. But if you do sort of a very simple implementation, which we'll formalize in a second, which lots and lots of places do, if you look through the lens of stable matching theory, you see that it might not even do what it's supposed to do. It's not helping any of the agents. OK. So now, first round of more formalism. So we're going to give the agents types. Capital M and little m will be majority and minority. The allocation of types is you know, what these types mean is actually not necessarily important for this. It's just we need the agents to have two types, and the quotas are going to restrict the total number of type capital M, so the total number of majorities at the school. So we have now both the capacity vector Q and 
the majority quota vector Q capital M. Okay? Matches are now going to specify assignments of students to schools while respecting capacities and quotas. So this notation, which is slightly abusive notation, is going to mean the set of agents, or set of students rather, who are in the majority. OK. I promise it won't get too much more notation heavy than the next slide. This looks really complicated. Now I'm going to give you the technical definition of stability in the form that we actually use it. The reason I'm doing this is that we're going to see an example where you actually, we're actually going to walk through and look at the stable outcomes. And so I want you guys to actually believe me. You know, I don't want to be throwing any of, the, any of the technicality under the rug. I want you to actually see you know, this very strange outcome effect is going to be one that actually happens in truly stable outcomes. That said, we're going to have to spend time on this definition to make sure we have it. I promise it's essentially the same definition you saw before, except with this additional majority quota component just written in full notation. So a match is going to be stable in the presence of quota. Sorry, I should say a match mu. If it is individually rational, so nobody wants to drop out of school. This is just you prefer your assignment to being unmatched. And it's unblocked. So now, suppose you prefer school C to your assigned match. Well, either the old condition holds. So either, sorry, uh, the school is full. So mu of C is at capacity. And everyone there has higher priority than you do. So that's just the old condition. So it's, it's still not a block if there's no one who, want, who you can trade with. But now, the second possibility, your type is majority, and the majority quota slots at the school are full. So they can't actually accept any more members of the majority. So that's this condition. Mu of C, the assigned students at C, intersected with a set of majority students. <coughs> Is equal, to the, is equal to the quota. And all of the majority students at the school have higher priority than you. So there might be students at the school who have lower priority than you, but they're all minorities. Okay, so if you're a majority student who wants to block, who wants to move to this school, you can't because all the majorities there, majority students there, have higher priority, and the quota is full. Okay? So this is the generalized stability think, for thinking about quotas. It was written down explicitly in Fuhito Kojima's paper, which is now, I guess, just published in Games and Economic Behavior. And Fuhito was looking at the question of what happens if you impose quotas? What does this do if you're using stable matching mechanisms? So you guys could naturally imagine a world in which we took the student optimal stable mechanism. In fact, at the very end, we'll see exactly how to do this, and add these quotas into the mix. And now we're going to run the student optimal stable mechanism in the presence of quotas. So it's going to keep filling the school until, well, it's going to keep filling the school, except now it's going to take some set of students. I can write on this board, right? Yesterday it had stuff on it, but OK. So here's your majority quota. When you hold your best acceptable set of students, you're now going to hold your best acceptable set of students up to this quota. And then down below it, you're going to hold your best acceptable set of minorities. Otherwise, exact same process. So is, yep. Is there a complementary statement for minority students that says all of the minority students have the school those have the So if you're a minority, you're just in this category for now, right? So we'll only let the minority block if there's a student to switch with. So if you have higher priority than a majority student, you can switch with them no matter what. And if you have higher priority than a minority student, you can switch with them no matter what. Yeah. Correct. I have made no assumption other than the existence of a ranking and that every student has one of these two types. So I think the branch question, I think that's where it comes into play, where you can the school, the measurable criteria, for the 
you answered my question before, but yeah. Cool. Okay, so everybody get that? We have, we have sort of very weak assumptions about where these are coming from, but I'm going to show you an example. And I'm going to claim afterwards that the example is not pathological, even though I've sort of allowed the full preference and priority domain at the moment. Last basic definition. This we've sort of been using implicitly. A mechanism is going to be stable if it always selects stable outcomes. So the student optimal stable mechanism is an example. You could imagine having other ones. They wouldn't be strategy proof, but we're going to prove a theorem about all stable mechanisms. So a mechanism which respects the spirit of quota-based affirmative action is one that has the property that when majority quotas are decreased, so this is I have decreased the number of majority students allowed into the school. Right? So I'm, I'm increasing the preference for minority in some sense. Minority outcomes improve. This is sort of a natural thing to want if you're going to impose a quota-based affirmative action program to help minorities. We agree? I'm not seeing any heads shaking. Good. OK, so no stable mechanism respects the spirit of quota-based affirmative action. Well, but, yep. Wouldn't you want it to be the optimum before? Because otherwise, why would you want it uh, restricted even more? I'm not sorry. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you're, if I get this right, it means that if you allow more minority students in, it should be even better for uh, the minority outcome, no? Well, that's, that's what we're trying to impose as the condition. That's right. So if you, if you decrease the number of majorities you're going to allow, this should somehow help the minorities weakly. So what you're saying is that if that's the case, why wouldn't that be the optimum? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like, I'm why, saying if you start at an optimum, then obviously it might not get better. For I see. Out. I understand the question. OK. So we're, we're in two different spaces. So the student optimal stable mechanism is respect, with respect to a fixed set of quotas and capacities. So for any individual quota and capacity set I have, so maybe there's only one school, and it has capacity QC and majority quota QCM, I can define the student, I can run the student optimal stable mechanism with these values in the school's, you know, in the school's choice function, essentially. The question is, so there's, there, this is like SOSM sub Q. I can also define SOSM sub Q tilde, where I have you know, Q tilde equal, sub C equals Q sub C, but Q tilde sub M is less than Q C super M. So now I've decreased the majority quota. I've, I've said you, fewer majorities are allowed into the school. I run again the student optimal stable mechanism. So I pick the optimal stable outcome for students under this quota and capacity structure and ask what happened. So in both cases, so this is, this is subtle. So let's not move on until we've really got it. So in both cases, I can define one outcome as student optimal. It's the one that it's the best outcome for students the best outcome for students given the fixed capacity and quota structure. But when I change the quota structure, the optimal allocation, the student optimal allocation will change. The set of stable matches changes entirely. Because if in the old stable match, I had a majority student right at this, you know, right at this line, I change the lines now here, this guy can't be here anymore. The match wasn't stable, is no longer stable. Does that make sense? Not, yep. Okay, so let's come back to that in a second. Let me make sure everyone's clear on the what the definition says, and then I'd love to have a discussion about this, because this is, this is actually going to be a relevant question. OK? So does this say any marginal increase in the majority has to improve more than the So if you want to prove that this doesn't hold, you just want some example. That's right. So doesn't mean there's no examples that do improve. Uh, Correct. Yes. Yeah, no, so this is, this is very much where we're going. However, the reason we're starting here 
is that we're going to find that sort of a strictly more effective way to guarantee, you know, a, a way to rule out all examples where things go wrong is by changing the way you implement the affirmative action program. So quotas are sometimes going to cause really serious problems. They're sometimes going to cause Pareto improvements. So you, it's actually also the case that quotas can sometimes remove some of the problems that we were seeing yesterday. So remember this impossibility theorem. Let's see if I can do this in, I probably can't do it in the same colors from yesterday. But we had this impossibility theorem where Steven was showing up, kicking me out over to here, and then Jim was kicking Steven out. So he was ending up over here, but the fact that he was kicking me out of this school was causing a problem. Well, suppose Steven's in the majority and Jim and I are in the minority. Well, now if we impose a quota that stops Steven from moving to this school, we've actually removed this Pareto inefficiency. He can never kick me out anymore. And so it will sometimes turn out to be the case that quotas can be Pareto improving as well. So what we're going to see is actually the, the effects of quotas are very uncertain. And you need to know a lot. You sort of need complete information before you set them to understand what's going to happen. And in a few minutes, we're going to see what I think is a better approach. But OK, uh, close parentheses. Let's make sure we understand the definition, and then we'll talk, and then we'll debate it. OK, are you clear on the definition? Yes, I Great. Don't like it. <laughs> OK, so maybe, maybe we don't like it. That's OK. All right, great. Let's figure out why we don't like this definition. So we've already had some reasons. So what's a succinct statement of yours? OK, so a succinct, a succinct statement of yours. Let's see. So you're worried that really we should know, we care more about if you impose some quota, does that help? Not the adjustment within the quotas, right? OK, so we should only be thinking about you know, 0, 1, if AA or no. OK, what else? Why don't you like the definition? Same thing, OK. Any other reasons we dislike this definition? And then I think they were also saying that if there, are, there are some <clears throat> cases that this says if there's even one case that we say it doesn't respect. Yeah, the maximal domain. Done. Good. What else? Those are the two? Steven. I just follow that up. There's no anti discrimination. There's no discrimination. Anti discrimination. So clarify what you mean by that? I, I, it seemed to me that the, uh, the it's the same thing about maximal domain. I want to restrict it, but the way that I would do it is to require the schools to justify it. Ah. OK. And this is too static in some sense. First of all, we divided the students into only two groups, minorities and, mi and majorities. And then the school just sets a blanket majority quota. And that's the only lever they have to pull in this system. Is that a good interpretation of what you're saying? They can't, you know, they, they can't say, well, this student really doesn't belong here, or this student really does. Or you know, pare it down to majority students who get poor test scores or something like that. Sort of the fact of grants initial observation, I would think that the schools would have to they're at least an observable like measure. So I'm a little bit confused. If a black student has a 1600 and the school says they prefer it, ah, with it. Sorry, I understand. Yeah, this is a really big one. We'll come back to this later in a lot of detail. Uh, if we just set a majority quota and we bring new minorities into the school, are we actually bringing new minorities into the school or are we bringing the ones that would have gotten in otherwise? Are we only helping the ones who already had high test scores? Things like this. Yes? I'm still doing it wrong. Sorry. Let me. Go ahead. I, I, I just have a different view. I, I want to clean the statement between anti-discrimination rules and affirmative action rules. Maybe I'm pushing too hard on this particular model. OK. So anti-discrimination versus affirmative action. Scott, I think I'm going to trick with that question. No, no, no. This is, this is actually very relevant. So anti-discrimination versus affirmative action. This is just a story about quotas, right? We have two types of agents. We don't know anything about them. And we're just saying, 
cut down the number of majorities who are allowed in the school and we're asking does it let more minorities in. It has nothing to do with their previous ac access to schooling. It has nothing to do with their previous performance. In fact, in practice, they're mostly going to be ranked by test scores. Later, we're going to see that there are subtle design changes you can make that will affect the degree to which students who scored badly versus scored well are given access to the open reserve, or to the reserve slots. And so I think this is very relevant, but it's going to be a different reason why this definition isn't good. Right? So all of these are sort of criticisms of the way in which the problem is being approached you know, from, at a technical level. You know, it's a maximal domain theorem. It only says there is some example where things can go wrong. This is more of a criticism of you know, the global model. right? It's a criticism of the way in which I've set up the priority structure and the quotas and capacities. I've sort of only given you very, very simple levers. Is that a fair response? OK. So for sure, one thing we're going to want to do, and we will do before the end of the talk, and if we don't, please yell at me is we'll give more levers. We'll try and make the process a little bit more about affirmative action than anti-discrimination. But here, where we're, sort of, where we're thinking about maximal domain results, those distinctions actually don't make as much of a difference because this can always be a special case of some more general model. And maximal domain, as you guys have observed, you're just looking for the counterexample or the class of counterexamples. And so expanding the model and making it more general, the counterexamples remain. James. Um, I would have thought that a mechanism which gives us a majority quote is a uh, the minority outcomes improve when majority quote is decreased over some range mm -hmm. would be good enough. Whereas this implies it's across the whole. This is, this sure. is monotonic. OK, so that's part of this uh, AA or none thing, okay. right? So, you know, you could also weaken this a little bit and say it's got to be true over some range. Fine. Good. Well, luckily, that one, well, luckily or unluckily, that entire critique is going to turn out to not be a big problem for this theorem or this maximal domain theorem. Because the example I'm going to give you starts with actually no binding quota. And we make the quota binding, and everything goes wrong. So what's the story? Well, there are three students, two majority students, I1 and I2, and one minority student, I little m. The majority students like school one. The minority students like school two. So at the moment, there, we start with absolutely no binding quotas. right? So the capacities are just equal to their quotas. Each school has, you know, capac or the capacities have, are two and one, and the quotas are two and one. So the students can go wherever they like. There's, in fact, a unique stable match. And it is to send the two majority students to school one and the minority student to school two. They've I guess they're self-segregated in this example, but that's not actually relevant or necessary for the robustness of the example. So now, what happens if I impose a quota at school one? Well, now, I kick out the less good majority student at school one. He comes down to school two and kicks out the minority student, and he ends up at school one. So if you look over here, previously, all the students had their favorite schools. Now, both the second majority student and the minority student are worse off. So this is sort of the same example we saw yesterday, right? When we were talking about respecting improvements of school quality. With these matching models, it's possible that kicking someone out of one school for whatever reason is going to create some chain reaction that's going to come back and send you people you like less or who like you less. Right? He left the school, and he took up this other slot. This is actually also something you can imagine happening in the real world. Right? Even if you're not using a centralized stable matching mechanism, if the student's outside option is to go to his second choice school, if he's really desirable to that school, then somebody new will be pushed out. And that person might, in principle, be part of the group you're trying to help. It's not quite as susceptible either to the critique, oh, well, this is a small market. Because remember, here it's about agents of different types, right? So if, you know, if their bottom student at this school is at school two is likely to be a minority student, the majority student showing up and kicking someone out is kicking out a minority student. And even if they come up to fill school one, maybe they're not nearly as happy there. 
for whatever reason. It could be something about school composition. It could be that they legitimately don't prefer it. It could be that it's too expensive to get there. I'm not going to take this too seriously because I think this is sort of a fairly stylized model for the issues that Stephen raised and others. But nevertheless, this sort of effect goes on when you do quota-based affirmative action in stable matching. Yeah. So that's right. So there's, n well, yeah, that's right. There's no formal worst school in this setting. And if you have uniform, I think I put this theorem on one of the slides. If you have complete agreement over the ranking of schools, so if everyone likes the, a single school the best all the way down to the bottom, quota-based affirmative action should help. What actually happens, though, so there's a paper, Hafelir uh, Yenmez and Yildirim, which we'll talk about in detail soon, they did a bunch of simulations with all sorts of different preference distribution draws. The answer on what's going on with the quotas is just it's extremely high variance. So it can be tremendously Pareto improving, and it can be tremendously Pareto inferior. And generally, it's you know, not too good or too, it's not too good for the minorities, and it's really bad for the majority students. So you're right. So this is not a perfect response. I'll get you in one second. This is not a perfect response to the, uh, to the critique that we came to yesterday. It's more an example of sort of one of the things that can happen with quotas. And I can't show you sort of a, you know, a big market in real practice because we don't actually have any empirical data of something that looks like this. But simulations do suggest that this sort of effect and the related other problems, there are, some, there are several others that Fujito goes through in his paper, don't quite go away. Yes. So <clears throat> I don't know, but it's my impression that this framework could be a little tricky because the the whole issue of affirmative action is not uh, like match every, everybody when they want to go. Mm -hmm. Is uh, send the poor kids to good schools, and uh, that's a little bit different. Yeah. So because self, the, your example is. I mean, it's one in which they have self-selected. It's self, self segregation that is a reality, right? No, that's right. So you might think that from the social planner's perspective, this is actually doing reasonably well, right? You know, you've, you've taken the minority student kicking and screaming and sent to the school that the majorities prefer. Given the distributions of schools in, the, in most countries, that's probably something that's improving their outcomes. Well, most countries where the majority, it, I'm not going to claim most countries. Uh, you can have some places where the minority is some like extremely small but very rich group. Um, that's right. So here, again, it's a little bit of a conflict between the school's goal and the student's goals. So this is going on in San Francisco public schools. So I mentioned that they're using, we think they're using top trading cycles, maybe. But the reason they wanted to use top trading cycles, so the reason they coordinated on that mechanism was that their utility function was very, very tightly linked to diversity. So they, they were you know, f of diversity comma performance where the coefficient on diversity was huge. And it turns out that top trading cycles can be used to encourage diversity. It might be that the students didn't love this. right? So they, if they actually wanted to go to school with people of their backgrounds or didn't want to have to take large amounts of transportation, you know, Forcibly diversifying all of the schools by a large amount might not be the optimal thing from the student's perspective. So you're right. So nobody has actually, this is, I was planning on talking about this during the panel on open questions, but let's think about it for a minute now. Nobody really has a good understanding of what happens in these matching models when there's a social planner or a school board, somebody with some exogenous and different goal. So I've worked a little bit with Typhoon Sonmez and owner Keston on the analogous question for the cadet branch matching. So the story is, well, now the army also wants to maximize the years of service and all things being equal, the years of service by the better cadets. It turns out there are actually tons of impossibility theorems. It's very hard to come up with extremely specific and always correct advice on what the army should do with their allocation of branch of choice slots. Similarly, I know Clayton Featherstone, when they were working with the San Francisco school board, our school system, 
found similarly, you know, a lot of impossibility results. If you're trying to do things like maximize diversity, it's hard to also make the students really happy. But nobody has sort of a good general theory of this, and this is something that you know, both the at the theory level and at the empirical level I think would be very, very valuable. More questions? Okay, I don't want to belabor this example too much. Uh, I did point out that this is actually a Pareto inferior outcome that we're getting. It's not just bad for the minorities, but it's bad for everybody. The real takeaway, as I've said, the quotas are unpredictable. Fujito has another example where they cause a striking Pareto improvement. I don't remember if it's exactly this situation. I think it's one of those class of models. And they find similar results for a different type of affirmative action system, again, in this course model, and also for top trading cycles. So he has this paper that just came out in Games and Economic Behavior that's sort of a paper of counterexamples. You know, they're not even sort of thick maximal domain theorems. They're just all saying, think about it. Something's, something's wrong here. But something's wrong here. You guys have sort of already gotten to it, right? It's that the minority students are being forced to go to the good school. So what's happening? So this is where the minority is going. He's going to school one. We changed the quota. What we did is we kicked a majority student out of school one. What's weird about this? And to what extent do we think that you had to kick somebody out, and you had to kick somebody out. Or sorry, you didn't, you didn't need to kick somebody out. You said it exactly right. I apologize. So you didn't actually have to kick anybody out of the first school because the minority didn't want that seat. Right. So you've gone exactly where Hafelir, Yenmez, and Yildirim went. So Fujito circulated this paper for a couple of years before anybody noticed this. Sorry? Yeah, unfortunately, it's forthcoming. Um, but that's OK. So very slight digression. I often work at a summer program for high school students doing summer research. Usually, every other summer or so, there's a student who accidentally rederives something that appeared in a major math journal two or three years earlier. It's not a bad sign if you're coming up with ideas that are forthcoming in TE, so you know, really, really good sort of intermediate general interest field journals on the spot in the middle of a lecture. And granted, the lecture was somewhat designed to get you to the point at which you were thinking about this, but like still, it took multiple years for people to come up with this and realize that this was really what was breaking this quota-based system. So, you know, unfortunately, it's forthcoming, but this is, should give you a high prior that you can do similar things again. Good, OK. So having a majority quota for C decreases the number of majority students that can be assigned to C, even if there are empty seats. So this causes the majorities to go and compete for other schools. This is really weird. It turns out that all of the problem, in a certain sense, is coming out of that. And that's what motivates the theory of Affirmative action with minority reserves. So, Hafeli, Yenmez, and Yildirim continue. I apologize, incidentally, I'm quoting very liberally from their introduction, which is one of the best written introductions ever. Um, you know, if you only go and if you go and read the introduction of this paper, you'll understand everything that's in the paper. It's very difficult to do this, especially when the paper is a reasonably hard theory paper. So, you know, I, I made you guys all read. Two things, if you were going to pick a third one, this would be a pretty good choice. OK. So the number of minority students preferring a school to another is not known a priori. And so if you try and guess the quotas to let more minorities in, that's kind of a really blunt instrument. You're trying to guess a quota on majorities that will allow the minorities to get into the school. What you really want to do is set a lower bound, you know, sort of reserve a bunch of seats for minorities if they want them. OK. Oh, sorry, the second part of this. And, and when you do that, so it's if they want them. They convert back into seats for, that are open to the majority students if the minorities don't want them. This is flexible. It means you don't have to revisit the quotas when like, there's a big demographic change or you redistrict the schools or something. 
If you have some story, this is the number of minority students I want to give access a priori, that's good. So now we can build out this model a little bit. So previously we had majority quotas and we had to respect them. Now we're going to have minority reserves. So quotas and reserves. And what's the natural relationship going to be basically everywhere we talk about them? Well, so here's the quota. So he said no more than these can be majority. Well, that means I wanted these to be available to the minority. So this is 0, and this is q sub little c. So the reserve, r sub c super m, is going to be q sub c minus q sub c. Sorry, this is supposed to be a little m. It's really unfortunate that m's look basically the same written on the board. The reserve for the minorities is going to be the total capacity minus the original quota we were trying to set. And this is actually, we're going to see, going to completely fix the problem we just observed. OK. One more stability definition. Getting a little bit more complicated, we have another component of the definition. Individual rationality, same as it's been throughout. Unblockedness. So now we really have to look and see what's going on. So first of all, the capacity is full. So you can always block just by moving to a school that has an empty seat that you want. So we'll assume that you know, if there's a block, it has to involve a school where the capacity is full. So we're going to rule out, as before, the possibility that minorities want to move in and have higher priority than somebody. Right? So if you're a minority it had been, and you want to move in, so you prefer school C to your assigned match, it had better be the case that everyone at the school has higher priority than you. So now how about these majorities? So before, remember, we had this condition that said the majorities had to only want, could only want slots if their quota was not full or if their quota was matched and they had higher priority than somebody who's already there who's a majority. Well, now we have to sort of take these, that component apart. So you're a majority. The reserve slots are full, and you have higher priority. And then everyone had better have higher priority than you. Or the reserve slots are not full, and all the majority students there had better have higher priority than you. So if the reserve slots are not full, we're going to let any minority who wants to come in take it. If the reserve slots are full, it's basically back to our standard stability. You're just, you're just competing now over these slots, the non-reserves. And so nobody, you know, people can only take them if they have higher priority than the people currently assigned. OK? Let's cut out the timing, though, because if this is an equilibrium outcome of the reserve spots, I should be able to take it. Right, this is a solution concept. So you're right, it's completely, you, this is completely right. So that whether the reserve slots are full or not is going to be determined in the outcome. It's a component of the equilibrium. This means that we're not at an equilibrium if these conditions aren't satisfied. So if somebody wants to move in, if they're a majority student and the reserves are full, then it's like, they're, you know, it's like before. They, they're just you know, trying to take any slot they can get their hands on. If the reserves are not full, we're not going to let majority students in unless they have higher priority than one of the other majorities. But we will let minority students in if they have high enough priority. So if there's someone at the school, they have higher priority then. And you're right. So when, whether the reserves are actually filled is going to be determined endogenously. Does that answer your question? Not sure. I just, if it's the best school, it should be full, it seems to me. Uh, right. But so that's the second feature. These reserves are not going to be, you know, the, are all going to be filled for the really good schools. So it's not going to be binding there, assuming there's sort of agreement on which schools are good and so forth. Well, suppose that for whatever reason the preferences are different between the minority and the majority mm -hmm. students. So all the majority students want to go to A, but all the uh, other ones want to go somewhere else. Then mm -hmm. you can have empty seats at the school all the majority of kids want to go to. Correct. Right? You can have empty reserve seats at the school all the majority kids want to go to. That's true. 
but what we're not going to do is force the majority students to, you know, we're going to force them out of the school they want to go to and have them kick out minorities from the school the minorities want to go to. Hmm? Not sounding too happy about this. What do we think? Is this the right model? It just seems like it's structured and inefficient somehow, that's all. Okay, so tell me more. What, what about it feels inefficient? Well, I mean, suppose I, I want to go to Harvard and they have seats, but I, I can't go and there's no, there's no uh, minority students who want to take those seats, but I still can't take it. Just do its own. Ah, so here, no, 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 so here, you're going to be allowed to take those seats. The reserves convert into seats that are open to the minorities if the minor uh, to majorities if the minorities don't want them. Yeah, so that's why I'm not in equilibrium. You're not going to have these empty things on the set. Oh, they're not going to be empty seats. That's right. They might be not occupied by minorities in equilibrium. Okay. That's okay. okay. Sorry. Everyone clear on how this works? Cool. Okay. Switching from quotas to reserves be behaves exactly as we've been predicting. So for any match stable under the quota system, there is a match that's stable under the reserve system. That's a Pareto improvement. So either the old match remains stable, or I can do some iterative process of moving the majorities back to the seats that they were being forced out of and improve for everybody. Minority students never Pareto prefer the student optimal stable outcome without affirmative action to the one with minority reserves. So unlike in the quota system where you can actually make all the minorities worse off by imposing quotas, you can never make them all worse off by imposing reserves. And under natural conditions, one of them is uniform agreement over the school qualities. One of them is one of these sort of bad neighborhood assumptions. You can show that minority students Pareto prefer having reserves to, having, uh, to not having affirmative action. So one of these is it's never Pareto inferior. The other is under natural conditions, it's Pareto superior for the minorities. And then you can do the same thing. And we won't go into this in too much detail, but they do a lot of the same exercises with top trading cycles. And the results are slightly weaker, but generally about the same. So looking at stable matches, let's just see that quotas are weird. Right? These are two things which both sound, and in fact, in the policy discourse, they'd probably both be called quotas. But there's a huge amount of subtlety in the way you impose the quota in your matching system. Right? And I think a lot of that subtlety will carry over to decentralized matching as well. None of this is stuff you can really talk about without some notion of the formal theory. Right, so remember I had this like long theory, practice, well, somewhat long, it was half of the slide width, I guess. Theory, practice, and valuation. It's really hard to do this evaluation without knowing what you're looking for. And the theory is what helped us understand what to look for. It's kind of weird, though. I mean, this school choice literature had been going on for maybe, I don't know, half a decade, seven years, something like that before people started looking at these questions. So there was a lot of this you know, first order foundational stuff. I mean, this entire school choice literature is new. You know, it's really about 12 years old at this point at most. But you can still, you know, just, just at the level of defining things, there's interesting research to be done. Trying to understand like, how the definitions interact with the mechanisms. Because one day, someone is going to say, in fact, they're going to do it without market designers help. So soon we'll see what Chicago has been doing for the past couple of years. One day someone's going to say, I want to design an affirmative action system within the stable matching framework or within something that's like the Boston mechanism or within whatever my current centralized system is. This goes on all the time. It turns out that the way you design it actually has really subtle implications for the outcomes. I mentioned that they did some simulations. The result. Reserves improve minority welfare. Well, we sort of knew that, but it turns out to be, again, a reasonably large number. They can hurt majorities, not terribly surprising. The minority reserves mechanism significantly, and I can't, uh, I shortened it on the slide, but they have a, a very nice sentence about the way in which this Pareto dominates the, uh, the quota-based system. Basically, quotas are extremely volatile and can hurt majorities a ton while hurting minorities. These reserves are much, much less volatile. And they're always helping the minorities. So they, they have a basic leg up over the quotas just at that stage. 
And then finally, and I don't know exactly how to think about this one, but maybe work for future, maybe relevant for future practical work. In general, top trading cycles makes the students happier than the student optimal stable mechanism does. This is sort of not terribly surprising, maybe, because top trading cycles is more actively letting the students trade. It's you know, going for Pareto efficiency rather than stability. But still, I don't know how to think about that yet. You know, we don't, and in greater sense, we know a lot about how the stable outcomes relate to the equilibria of Boston. We don't terribly know how top trading cycles fits in this mix to the same degree. And it hasn't been as relevant for applications because very few school boards are using top trading cycles. But we could easily imagine them being used, and so it's worth thinking about. Yeah? So when we talk about stable outcomes, yes. we're really talking about, like, um, we're not talking about actual necessarily seeing the stability in the world. Or, or more importantly, when we don't have stable outcomes, say we use top trading cycles, do we end, you know, is the fear that we end up in a world where students are always trying to switch around or, I mean. This is a great question. This is a great question. Uh, the question is, we say we care a lot about stability, but do we actually think people are getting on the phone and trying to change schools? It's kind of a weird thing. So let's, let's, even, let's go back to a, an even broader thought experiment and try and narrow on it. So here's the United States drawn really badly. Yeah, it's terrible. I apologize. OK, so here, suppose we had a matching mechanism which you know, assigned someone over here, gosh, to Maryland. It's it a hospital in Maryland. And there's really like you know, a hospital far out on the you know, northwest coast, or better, up here in Alaska, that they prefer or would prefer them. Well, maybe they have really heterogeneous preferences, so they call the guys in Alaska and say, really? Like, yeah, there's someone else wanted to go to Alaska? But no, more seriously, if there was you know, one blocking pair, and it involved somebody in Maryland figuring out that he could move to Alaska, that seems like pretty unlikely to actually cause a really big problem at the level of tens of thousands of medical students. Agree? One less than 25,000 by a large amount. So that's, you know, in the medical match, we care a lot about stability. We worry that we one day might not find a stable match because of these couple constraints. And yet in practice, if the instabilities are sufficiently sparse, maybe it's not a huge deal. The problem there is that we think the instabilities aren't that sparse. We think that there are sort of specific places that people are more likely to call. You know, everyone's going to call Mass General. But OK, fine, you could build that in. There's actually a computer science paper that was circulated about two years ago, two and a half years ago. I think it was published in the Proceedings of the Workshop on Internet and Network Economics, if you're curious, that said, well, OK, let's assume there's some underlying network. And people can like only block across networks of people they know. So it's like a, a stability with geography type notion. Well, can you do anything more there? And the answer is maybe yes, maybe no, but it seems to be NP hard to figure out when you can. Um, all kind of sounds a little nebulous, but it's not too worrisome in worlds where we can find stable outcomes. But you might say, what if we want to have a Pareto efficient outcome when we can't get a stable one? Well, so New York had a Boston-like mechanism. And people actually were getting on the phone. And they were getting on the phone in huge numbers. So I think I mentioned that the schools were withholding like hundreds of seats. They were just not reporting to the school system that they had you know, these extra 100 seats. And then they were waiting for parents in their neighborhood to call them and say, I didn't get into your school. Can I come? And they yeah, sure, we got a seat for you. So there, the instabilities were really thick, and people were finding them. And the mechanism was really unstable ex post. There's some evidence, I believe, be careful how I say this. There is certainly evidence that stable mechanisms have survived better in practice than unstable mechanisms for medical matching. So Al has this paper where he looks sort of all over the world at different residency programs. Again, England. They have all sorts of you know, small districts that have their own programs, both for school choice and for medicine, and finds that the unstable ones usually collapsed reasonably quickly, and the stable ones usually sustain themselves. There are also 
I think is at least anecdotal evidence that there were some instabilities in the medical system that were being found, you know, in the medical match in the U.S. that were being found before they switched to the stable mechanism. That said, and sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll close this digression in one second. That said, let's put this example back on the board. Uh, owner Keston, that impossibility result was not the main point of that paper, so it's QJE 2010. Actually, what he proposes is to improve the efficiency of the deferred acceptance algorithm by explicitly removing these sorts of problems while the algorithm is running. So you take in everyone's preferences, and you start running deferred acceptance. And whenever you hit one of these instances where somebody kicks out someone and then gets kicked out, so it's sort of a block that's not real in some sense, you scroll back the algorithm, don't assign him there, take it out of his preference list, and continue running. And this actually seems to give pretty significant efficiency increases without too, too much cost on other dimensions. There's also this paper, I'll come back to this, I'll come back in a second. There's also this paper of um, Erdl and Ergen. I do those in the correct order? Yeah, Erdl, Ergen. Um, AER something that called on the stable improvement cycles algorithm where you run top trading cycles after the stable match. There again, you, know, sort of you can do lots of things to improve the efficiency at the cost of strategy proofness. Uh, Jacob Leshno and Eduardo Azevedo, who were both on the market this past year, have a paper which claims that you're really giving up strategy proofness. So the, the, the loss in terms of the strategic behavior is just tremendous if you try and do this for any value. But there are possibilities of tweaking to try and get at efficiency while giving up some blocks that you think don't matter as much. Yeah, could you, yep. um, so if you had a so, uh, top trading cycle were instituted after the uh, first round, uh, after the, the mechanism, the SOS um, mm -hmm. mechanism was run, but you had it occur with a certain probability rather than how it, then that, that, that stops people from wanting to. Possible. OK, so the suggestion is if you're going to only allow the trades in the top trading cycles round with some positive pro uh, but non-1 probability, maybe if you add risk aversion into the model, people are not going to go grab for the school they really don't like but that everyone else does. Maybe so. Uh, there are not many good models of this stuff with risk aversion in the world. That isn't because it's not a good idea. It's just because we haven't had the technology for it. Uh, one good example that comes to mind, Peter Coles has a paper on sequential matching mechanisms, where there's this strategy where you might try and get kicked into the next round to be the top of the next round rather than the bottom of the current one. And it turns out that for sort of reasonable, I don't, you know, it's a stylized model, so I don't know how to map these parameters into real numbers. But for reasonable looking risk aversion parameters, you don't get too worried that this is going to cause serious problems. A couple more questions. I think you had one. Yeah, um, so, I'll, I'll, so I actually I, I have two. One is um, just, just a curiosity mm -hmm. on the on, on the Keston. Um, yep. Is, is that going to be computationally feasible? And in general, are, are these, is there ever an issue with computation in a large, large, in a large uh, sample? OK. That's actually a very subtle question. So the answer is generally, most of the things we do don't have computational issues with them. So deferred acceptance takes quadratic time. I'm not going to spend too much time in this because it's probably you know, not as exciting to most of the people in the room. But deferred acceptance is pretty fast. This, you, know, you're, you can get at most uh, n squared of these weird blocks, right? So that's also going to be in some polynomial. I don't know what it is. Outside the realm of things we know, like the question of testing whether there is a stable match in the presence of couples, things start getting NB hard very quickly. If you're, I can give you some references on this, but let's talk about it offline. More questions. You had one? Yep. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, one thing about the, the, um, the risk aversion mm -hmm. idea, the one thing is it seems like parents who have an easy exit to private schools don't have that much reason to be risk averse. Yeah. And I feel like this raises a more general point. I mean, I guess I found the question about stability surprising because it seems to me that we ought to care about strategy and this an awful lot if the point is to be dealing with inequality. Yep. I think that's partly, you know, for sort of obvious direct reasons, but I also feel like indirectly, there's a big social cost to having parents or social dominant groups organizing themselves for the sake of getting better things for their kids as a group as opposed to what's happening to kids from socially dominated groups. 
And if we're planning policy, I think we should take that seriously. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, a lot of the things we can do to modify the mechanisms involve giving up strategy proofness. And even doing that a little bit, you have this opportunity for parents to get together and do the best job they can. And it's going to be the overrepresented parents who are doing that most of the time. Yeah. Thank you. Very good point. Yes? I was wondering about the, the sampling technique for the simulation. The idea that I'm just going to draw them randomly, or I mean, it, it seems like a very interesting question to to look at, you know, well, wouldn't we expect in something like school preference for there to be a lot of, like, correlation with transitivity, you know, if we work for first standards, yep. the Harvard would probably all get first standards, or Princeton, or something like that. Designing an algorithm that... No, the question is, if we're running these simulations, are we assuming fully uniform preferences drawn yeah. very independently, or something like that? You're doing all this stuff on a computer. I mean, I there's some, like, uh, yeah, confidentiality, but it's a terrible waste of data, you know. Uh, be able to look at that stuff and you know, design algorithms based on the okay. distribution. Right, so there are, there are two questions in this question. One of them is, yeah, you know, how, what are these simulations like? We're doing a bunch of simulations. Was there tons of independence? So I don't remember the exact specification, but they did things where they drew sort of degrees of correlation between the preferences in different ways. You know, they, they were try, you know, both within group and across group. You know, they, they were trying to get at that question a little bit. Um, you check their paper, they've got you know, a block where they explain the whole specification. I don't remember it off the top of my head. That said, the second part of the question was, wouldn't it be nicer if we could use the real data? That's for sure true. We have lots of trouble getting at the real data. Uh, one approach that's been going on, no one's quite cracked yet, but as I said, there are some students working on this currently that I know, is to try and use structural methods. You know, take things about the outcomes and try and back out the preferences, and then run simulations with preferences from these distributions. Another one, you know, we have some information about the preference data. So in a few minutes, I'll show you a simulation done using the Chicago preferences. And, you know, in order for them to, to convince them to give them to us, they had to completely anonymize them. So not only did they, you know, not tell us which schools were most popular or whatever, they asked us not to try and reconstruct them. So as part of the agreement, there are only nine elite public high schools in Chicago. I could probably figure out which one had which you know, total quota, or total capacity, rather. You know, I promised that I was not going to do that. But there are possibilities to get data and do things like that. And again, as I say, Parag is sort of you know, the, the epicenter for all of this. So if you want to know the current state of what exists, and I would talk to him. Yeah, please. I'm wondering about information. Yes. And I'm thinking, OK, we can have these reserves, but yep. if you know, this, these parents and students aren't sophisticated as the other parents and don't know. I mean, when we're talking about school districts, it's kind of like not to know about what school. But I'm thinking about you know, yeah. broader application. If I don't know about your program, no, I'm not going to want to apply. So yeah. like, how does this model? Or does that's it? huge. OK, that's, that's totally huge. So outside of every model we've taught, oof. Sorry. Outside of every model we've talked about, this also, this also is a major, major open question. A piece of practice is explaining the mechanisms to the participants. Right? So the doctors in the residency match, some of them get confused. So the hospitals have only one strategic lever they can really pull against the doctors, which is trying to lie to them about what the mechanism does. <laughs> and believe me, there are hospitals that do this. They say, you know, you should rank, the way this mechanism works is you should rank us first on your preference relation. And I would teach seminars to some of the Harvard Medical School students. Like these are very smart guys, um, guys and girls, um, men and women. I don't know what the correct, uh, these are very smart people. These are very, very smart people. These are people who, you know, one day I suspect I will hope to have as my surgeons should I need them. And it took three explanations to really make it clear to them the way in which the hospitals were trying to manipulate them. Meanwhile, we send tons of literature. You know, it's, it's all public. You know, Al has worked very hard, and Elliot Perenson, they've to explain to people what they should do. Similarly, in school choice settings, if you have parents who don't really understand how the system works or what opportunities exist in the system, I'll come back in a second. 
how can you expect it to work? You know, we have all these nice theory models. They say, you know, these reserves are going to make things better for all the minority students. If the minority students don't understand that they've been given a new opportunity, they're just going to apply to their neighborhood schools or, you know, not fill out the form. This is a huge area that nobody's really figured out how to grip. Right? It's almost an area of entrepreneurship, right? It's not so much the thing you would write an economics paper about, although I think there are some, especially for those of you who are interested in the behavioral components, but just how to make it clear to people that a new mechanism that's been designed with an eye towards helping them actually will, if they do something reasonable, like reveal your preferences truthfully, play the easiest possible strategy. It's hard. And we don't know too much about it. There are, you know, we're very lucky every so often Somebody coming out, of, you know, coming out of a business school program decides that this is what they want to do, and there are some startups and, and or sort of consortia that have been built around them. And again, we're also lucky. Sometimes PhD economists do this. This is something you guys could all consider doing as well, although my guess is a lot of you expect, to be, you expect and plan to be mostly academics. But it's huge. If you can't take theory into practice at the level of explaining to the participants what's going to happen, the theory hasn't added anything. Okay, this is really important. You know, whenever you're thinking about doing engineering, you have to think about every single component of the thing you're building, and one of them in these settings are the participants. Okay. Yeah. So one thing I would kind of also connect to what was just is that I think we should also think about what the school has to provide. Yep. So let's say we're like in the first quarter of this model. Um, I mean, we have quotas, so we can't really get more majority students in any way, and we think that they're going to collect anyway. So we're going to advertise to the minority students to get that. Yep. So if our preference to get that from the school perspective. But then the other system obviously has very different incentives, right? If you have to do that. Yeah, that's right. OK, so did, did everyone get this? So the idea is that quotas might actually put slightly better advertising incentives on the schools than these reserves do. So they might actually go out and kind of try to attract the minority students, whereas like the reserve teacher would have an incentive to actually tell them that they have to prevent. So if, one if place. You have, yeah. I mean, so if you have. Yeah. No, if you have. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I mean, unless you think that they are bad or you want them to. Yeah, I guess then it wouldn't be mining. Right, so a big thing that the change in the way we've conceptualized our higher education system has done, you know, the move towards mostly socioeconomic affirmative action, and you know, before that, the move towards affirmative action in general, it's caused admissions officers to go out and talk to people they would never have talked to before. Right? That's an incredible way to provide access. You're just you know, changing, the, changing the set of people who get applications in the mail. You know, even if they just, you know, someone fills out an application with probability P, went up conditional on receiving it, even if P varies across groups, you know, if they never receive it, probability is zero. This is huge. This is also something I think we don't understand very well, you know, sort of how these things interplay with you know, the, the real world behavioral, not, behavioral not in the behavioral biasy sense, but the sociological essentially factors that go into these admissions pools. Yes? Oh, I don't know. Well, it seems to me that all this has to do with the fact that you are placing so much wedge in the in, in efficiency in terms of, uh, I mean, the final outcome just as if the individual get to uh, like realize their preference. I mean, to if I mean if they you you define outcome just in terms of I can go where I suppose to really want to go, mm -hmm. but. It will be more. It will be better, I think, if we, you are like digging out in terms of more wider range of things. Like, for example, in the example that you did, you gave, it yep. seems that the society could be better because uh, the I mean the outcome in terms of grade of all three students can be better. Right. So the so the the question again. So you talked about this earlier, and I promise we're about to get there. I think that's yeah. It's, Two slides away, maybe. Although I'm not gonna I'm not gonna satisfy either you or Steven to the degree that you guys would like. But one thing that's really sticky is we're talking about Pareto efficiency among the students. Right? And the social planner, you know, the true welfare optimum might be to have schools that are really diverse, 
or just to move students from bad neighborhoods to good schools and students from good neighborhoods to bad schools to make the schools better. You know, if, if there's huge complementarities, then you know, huge complementarities, but not huge enough that you, all, you want to put all of the best students in the same room, then you know, maybe this really isn't sort of the correct or a very satisfying thing to think about, this, you know, these Pareto efficiency looking concepts. Yes? I also, I mean, another thing is that the school can also just across other markets as opposed to the thing in Harvard and at the same time simultaneously decide who makes scholarships to do that. Yep. So, like, I mean, you can even see how the school produces very different markets. Okay, so I am literally going to transition on that note because you're exactly right. And that is essentially the topic of the remainder of the talk. So I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there were several other of these you know, affirmative action type problems or methods that are floating around. One of them is regional quotas. So Japan has tried to distribute doctors all over the country and force them into rural hospitals that they might not want to go to. This is sort of a mixed quota system. It's like a mixture between these quotas and reserves. And Fuhiro, Kama, uh, Fuhiro Kojima and Yuchiro Kamada have an interesting paper on this. Again, not sort of not a be-all, end-all, we think, but a very good step. Complex constraints. So Alex West Westcamp has a paper about the uh, German admission systems, where he generalizes the Hoffelier uh, et al. structure and sort of shows that you can build sort of a much more general framework around it. And then Typhoon and I have a paper, and this is what I'm going to spend most of the remainder talking about, that sort of tries to ask the question of how general can you go? You know, how many different components of these constraints can you allow? Can you add financial aid? Can you try and add something that looks like having some slots that are reserved, some that are quotas, some that you know, encourage people uh, of different, you know, that are open to people only if others are taken by other students? You know, sort of how many of these different levers can you pull at once? And it's going to have an empirical component. So I promise the Chicago data, it's one of the only times I know of where we actually have an, the preference data and can work with it directly. So minority reserves, we pass to a model of what we're going to call slot-specific priorities. So we're actually going to disaggregate from these blocks. We're going to disaggregate down to the individual seat level. And I'll show you how that's going to work. Quick notes. People are laughing already. I haven't. There's a pause on this slide. Oh. <laughs> right. Uh, by the way, those of you who use Beamer in your slides, backslash pause, very, very useful. It's how I do most of my overlays. Anyhow, um, so quick note. This component, so it's the last 40 minutes or so, is going to be more like a mini research seminar. So I'm trying to show you a complete area of research, and we're fighting about it, right? And we don't think that any of this stuff has gotten it quite right, and I'm not going to promise that I have either. In fact, I, I certainly will not promise you that I've gotten it quite right. I wanted to show you guys what work in this area looks like today. This is why we've been looking at now sort of this you know, very, very recent set of things on affirmative action. It's an aside. It's also extremely relevant to inequality. So I'm showing you research on market design that is relevant to inequality that's being done right now. It's going to have some corners, possibly. You know, please, you know, if we spend all of the time arguing about the basic definitions, that's great. Okay? You, know, you guys should be thinking about this now and evaluating it from the perspective not of people who are learning what's been done in market design, but seeing what is being done right now and thinking critically about it at the level you've been thinking about Fujito and Tafelier et al. All day, you know, the past hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Second note, and for this one, I apologize. When you talk about a paper that's very technical, after having talked about a bunch of other papers that are fairly technical as well, but all of which use different notation and terminology, there is a judgment call that has to be made about whether you're going to use the same notation throughout or try and stick with the notation that's used in the different papers. I have chosen to stick with the notation that is used in the different papers. This is not because it's complicated to change notation. I actually use macros for everything, so I can change it all sort of in one step. But rather that if you guys learn it from me in one notation and go and look at it in the papers and it's completely different, you'll basically have to start again from scratch. So I apologize tremendously for a couple of different reasons, 
which I'll point to as we get there, the notation is going to be different, somewhat the same, but different in some very crucial places that I'll point out, and the terminology will change slightly. OK? So beware. You know, keep this in mind. Yell at me if something's unclear. OK? And please yell at me if something sounds wrong. So here's the story. We've been talking a lot about theory. We talked yesterday a lot about practice. Well, one thing that happened, so there was this big revolution in the theory of matching, or the market design theory of matching, this thing called matching with contracts. So in 1982, uh, Kelso and Crawford wrote a paper that showed that matching this, this deferred acceptance algorithm, the student optimal stable mechanism, is sort of a lot like running an ascending auction. And you could use it both to like negotiate wage contracts in a market. So not just who works for whom, but also who works for whom and at what prices. And then in 2005, John Hatfield and Paul Milgram wrote, wrote sort of a different and, and in some sense slightly easier to read formalization of part of this idea, where they said, OK, why stop with wages? You know, why can't we do sort of any finite parameter space so you can negotiate the wages and the hours worked. And well, so in our context today, that's going to be things like, you know, do we give people extra legs up because of their background? Do we give them financial aid? In the context of cadet branch matching, that's do they take these additional three years of service? So it's like a very coarse auction where you only have one possible bid above zero. Hatfield and Milgram wrote this paper. There was a huge explosion of literature about trying to map out all of the theory surrounding matching with contracts. You know, what can you do with matching with contracts? I was, I was a part of this, so I should not you know, pass judgment on it. But it was tremendously theoretical. And while well, there was always a belief that one day we'd be able to use these matching with contracts mechanisms in the world, it would take a while. You know, Sorry, I, I emphasized that wrong. There was always a belief that we'd be able to use these in the world, but we thought it would take a while. You know, we sort of were imagining trying to explain to the people the medical match that they really want to have this additional component where they negotiate wages, or trying to explain to the Boston school system, wouldn't it be nice if people could, you know, if you have any sort of like scholarships or you know, lunches or whatever, you know, it's not even clear what you would do in the Boston school system like that. But maybe colleges that, have, you know, there's centralized matching in the Turkish admissions system. Typhoon Sunmez went out and looked. And what he discovered was that these matching mechanisms with contracts were actually being used in the wild already. So that was cadet branch matching. That was the discovery that these were already in use. So similarly, this Kojima and Hafalir, uh, Yenmez, and Yildirim literature was mostly in the abstract. It was like, what does it look like if someone tries to build affirmative action into a matching, a centralized matching mechanism. Well, it turns out that while all of these papers were being written, or in fact, really before they were written, this was already being done. So we're going to start by evaluating what it looked like in Chicago when they were already doing centralized matching with affirmative action. And we're going to take that, and we'll take it back and get some new insights for theory. And along the way, we'll mention Boston again, and we'll mention the, uh, the world of cadet branch matching very briefly. OK? So what's actually going on in Chicago? What did I not tell you guys yesterday? Sorry. I oversimplified one thing tremendously. And it's, in fact, oversimplified in Typhoon and Parag's paper. So in the elite public high school match, this is the one where they got rid of the Boston mechanism midstream. 15% of the slots at each school are, resolved, are reserved for each of one of four different socioeconomic classes, which for some inexplicable reason are numbered four through one, with four being the richest and one being the poorest. So the tier one students are the poorest students. I guess maybe if you think that this is like you know, their, their average wage scaled into some, or their parents average wage scaled into some reasonable metric, I don't know. And so what this actually means is that the priorities vary across the slots. So yesterday, we were pretending that within school, priorities you know, look the same for every slot. So it might be that the priority structure 
Oh gosh, so I use, there are two different bar, bar diagrams. So it might be that the priority structure, say, gives priority for walk zone, so walk, no walk, but every slot in the school has the same priority. Okay? So the priori students' priorities vary, but for every possible seat, you know, they're, they're all the same. So within school, there are no differences in priorities across the seats. Cadet branch matching said, no, wait, wait, wait. We want 25% branch of choice. So there's one priority order that fills all of these, and there's a different one for these that accepts these additional years of service contracts, OK? Well, it turns out that in Chicago, there were actually five different types of slots. There were open slots, and then type four reserves, type three reserves, type two reserves, and type one reserves. But that's a little problematic, because running the deferred acceptance algorithm, or the standard student optimal stable mechanism, assumes, and in fact requires, that the priorities are the same within schools. So they can vary across schools, but they have to be the same within schools. So what did they do? You know, Chicago was urgent midstream change. We're getting rid of the Boston mechanism. We're switching. We're switching. We've got to do it right now. What's the easiest thing to do? We'll just cut the school into five pieces. So they cut the school into five sub-schools. Did I do that right? Yeah. They're not in, proportion, in the right proportions, but you get the idea. They cut the school into sub-schools. They cut the school into subschools, and they make assumptions about which ones are filled first. Well, why do they have to make assumptions about which ones are filled first? Well, the students are actually completely indifferent about which subschool they go to, right? These are fake constructions just for the algorithm. So they just apply, you know, they rank schools. But the other thing these algorithms require is strict preferences. So we have to somehow break those indifferences and give the students strict preferences over subschools. And what they do is they assume that the open slots, the open subschools are filled before the reserved subschools. So it actually goes open, then four, then three, then two, then one. OK? So that's what it looks like. It's, you start with a bunch of seats that are just scored by test score. So the global priorities come out of test scores. And then you have a set that are reserved for, the type, or for tier four students and within tier are ranked by test score and so forth. But now, let's. Let's be inequality scholars. What do we know about minorities? It's on the board. Systematically lower test scores. And what else do we know? Well, this is a fact. You wouldn't necessarily guess this, but these are really elite college prep schools. So there are, they are four times oversubscribed. There are essentially four applications for every one seat. So Chicago made this very ad hoc decision. They just broke the subschools and said, we're going to fill the open ones before the reserved ones. Kind of sounds like a random change, right? There's nothing particularly significant about this at first glance. As an aside, they didn't have any particular reason to believe from sort of anything we knew at the time that this was a good design idea, right? They were trying to copy what was working in Boston and New York. And they just sort of copied it directly, but added the affirmative action component. In principle, it could have been that doing this cutting system could cause problems for strategy proofness. You know, there was no theory that would support, you know, there, 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 there's nothing that would support that hypothesis, but there's also nothing that would refute it. It turns out, and one of the things we do in this paper is we show that there's no problem, the mechanism is still stable and strategy proof. But this ordering choice is actually extremely non trivial. Well, why is that? Well, let's think about it. So consider this very extreme counterfactual where I put all the open slots at the bottom. What is that like? Well, the minorities have systematically low test scores. So here, the highest scoring minorities, so the highest scoring of the poorest students, compete first for open slots, and maybe they get some. So then by the time you get down here to the reserves, it's the low scoring minorities who take the reserve slots. So I'm seeing nodding. You guys are probably already guessing where we're going here. 
Well, now if the highest scoring minorities take the reserve slots, it's actually the low scoring ones you leave to, you, to compete for the open slots at the bottom. Yeah, it doesn't sound too good, does it? So if you, if you want to make it as good for minorities as possible, you should put the open one just before the minority. So four, three, two, open, then one. Uh, you strip all the high grade out so the, the, uh, the minorities have an advantage when you uh, compete with the open slots as well. So, oh, I see, yeah. So you put, right, so you do four, three, two, open, one. Yes, that's, we think that would be right. So there's a little bit of a subtlety here. Um, again, you have this weird small market effect where when you kick people out of one school, you can make the same type, you know, you can make them move to other schools and hurt people. So we think in large enough markets, that's exactly right. Can you that? Yeah. Sure, sorry. So the suggestion was, if we want to do the thing that's best for the minorities, we'd like to clear, you know, get all the boys off the street first. So get rid of the high scoring tier four, three, twos, and threes and twos then have the open slots, and then have the reserve slots. So sort of give the minorities as much of a leg up as possible. Peel off the people who are competing with them for the open slots, give them a shot at the open slots, and then give those who couldn't take the open slots the reserve slots. That's the suggestion. That, that would depend on the fraction of the minorities. Yes, you need to know a lot about the distributions to know fine-grained things like that. But I think to a first order, that's basically right. That would be a great way to make minorities the, the sole focus of the mechanism. Yes? I think a lot would benefit minorities, but it just seems a little arbitrary. Yes. You'll, go, you'll get no disagreement from me. So this was a theoretical question, I think. It was partially to make sure we understood what was going on, uh, and partially to sort of say, well, if you really wanted to favor the minorities, you should do this thing. But it looks really weird, right? You know, Phil, four, three, two open minorities. That's probably not going to pass whatever you know, test of the voting population you want to put it through. So that's right. So political economy might say you can't do that. But that is sort of, to a first order, I think, how you build a mechanism that favors the minorities as much as possible. But OK, so we have these large market intuitions that suggest it's probably going to be the case that moving these open slots to the bottom makes the minorities worse off. They don't give us any magnitudes. They don't tell us how large the market needs to be. We know in sort of sufficiently small markets that this actually might be wrong. It might be that moving the open slots to the bottom could help the minorities somehow, just like in the quota story. So we got the Chicago data, and we computed the answer. So one footnote is that, remember, the Chicago mechanism has these truncations imposed. So it's not actually completely strategy proof. So we can't actually claim that these are exactly the true preferences, but we think they're pretty close, both because not everyone in the database used up the full submission opportunity anyway, and moreover, you know, certainly the best we can have, and in this space, that's pretty good. Also, moreover, there, if you wanted to really try and tease it down on cardinal domains, some of these schools are really far away from each other. So if you look at the set of schools people could actually reasonably go to. It's probably a subset of the nine. But I can't defend that too much more strongly than that. You're going to have to trust me and we'll assume that people are going to submit the same preferences because the mechanisms are both strategy proof except for the truncation component. And the total changeover is actually huge. It's 18% of the slots. What's happening? Well, we can cut the data in several different ways. If we switch to fill the open slots last, it's almost, ascend it's almost entirely at the loss of the tier one students, so 91 seats lost. And they're sort of spread across, but it's actually mostly to the benefit of the tier three students. So the richest students are doing fine anyway. It's these guys who are you know, in the second richest socioeconomic class who are getting the additional benefit. More striking, perhaps, if you set it up so that the, quota the open slots are at the bottom, then you actually convert the reserves into quotas. So here's the 15% reserve at each school. And here is the tier one allocation. Seven of the nine schools, they just get their reserve slots. They don't get a single open slot. Even the tier two students, that's true at four of the schools. So this you know, ad hoc decision, and it really seems like it was just a coding decision, like, oh, shoot, we've got to break this tie. Let's do it one way or the other. This coding decision can have a huge impact. If they'd done it the other way, the mechanism would have turned out totally differently. Last cut, this is probably clear by now, but 
Tier one really does unambiguously prefer the current mechanism to filling the open slots last. No, tier one is the poorest. So the, the poorest students uh, prefer the current system where they have this additional access. They'd probably prefer James's even more, but as has been said, maybe that's not sort of the most you know, political economy feasible sounding idea, and maybe we don't want to do it because it seems unfair on other grounds. Here, one way to think about what's going on, and you can like it this way or not, they set specific reserve numbers. You know, they decided how many slots they wanted to reserve for, agents, for students of each type. The order of the tie-breaking introduces a bias. It happens to be in a bias that goes in the direction of the stated policy goal. Right? The bias is essentially try, you know, is, is trying to give the access to the minorities who wouldn't have normally gotten in or had any opportunity to get in before. But nevertheless, they introduced a bias just through this ad hoc tie-breaking assumption. And that's worrisome in all directions. right? So here the bias goes in what we think is probably the right direction, but it's also just fundamentally a bias they didn't understand. This is particularly worrisome because a similar thing goes on in Boston. So here's Chicago. Here's Boston. So now Boston is also using a mechanism that has two different types of priorities within school. There are open slots that are school choice slots, essentially. And then there are walk zone priority slots that give walk zone priority. So the reasons for this are twofold. One of them is that the walk zone lobby is pretty strong. You know, they bought houses in good neighborhoods, and they'd like to be able to send their kids to, this, to the good schools. The other, which is you know, perhaps sort of an even more politically clear reason, it's expensive to bus students all over the place. And if you favor the students in the walk zone, then you save on busing costs. So Boston has two very powerful school choice lobbies. One of them is the choice lobby, the one that wants sort of all the slots at all the schools to be open. And one of them is the walk zone preference. And so Boston split them in half. So they divide each school into two subschools. And they assume that the walk zone subschools are filled before the open ones. So there's a bit of a puzzle. So the stated policy goal in Boston, you know, if, you, if you look at all the recent literature, the quotes from the mayor and so forth, is to reduce the transportation costs. You know, they, their transportation costs are through the roof. They really want these walk zone priority students getting a lot of access. They want to, they want to favor the walk zone students. So just like the Chicago schools like to favor the poorest students, Boston wants to favor the walk zone students. Well, here are their two mechanisms side by side. So Chicago fills the open slots and then the reserve slots. Boston fills the walk zone slots and then the open slots. So we've just seen that filling the reserve slots last favors the minorities. Here, filling the walk zone first is actually disfavoring the walk zone students. So in Boston, they have affirmative action for walk zone students. And their bias is going against what is at least their stated policy goal. We don't have data from them to speak of. You know, so I can't, I can't tell you whether the number is as big or as significant as we saw in Chicago. But at least Chicago seems to have biased in the right direction, and Boston appears to have biased in the wrong direction. Yes? Other than being in the walk zone or not, what are they ranking to be done? Good question. So I believe in Boston it's just a randomized tiebreaker within group. So there may also, I don't remember whether there's also a sibling component in the Boston system, but we haven't talked very much about this at all. But really, there are these big indifference classes. This, I drew this diagram yesterday briefly. So there's you know, sibling and walk zone, sibling and non-walk zone, walk zone, no sibling, non-walk zone, no sibling. Uh, these are huge indifference classes, right? There's sort of at most four of them in a school system per, you know, per school. What they actually do then is they draw randomized tiebreakers among the students. So it's ex ante, you know, a lot of the fairness properties hold ex ante. Um, so here, what's going on, you know, essentially the students who have high walks or who are in walk zones but are looking at the walk zone slots are giving and have high lottery numbers are giving up their good lottery numbers. You know, those lottery numbers are being wasted. 
just like in Chicago, sort of the you know, the minorities who had the high scores when we moved the reserve slots to the top, they're wasting their high scores. In Boston, what's going on is the, you know, the students who have high lottery numbers and are in the walk zone are wasting the high lottery numbers. Yes? With all these changes in um, assignment me mechanisms in Boston, has mm -hmm. anyone looked at whether housing prices are influenced by the mechanism? That's a very good question. That paper has not been written yet to the best of my knowledge, although I think someone is currently working on it. Because we talked a little bit about that we don't know the ultimate outcomes of this, but that's actually, a, at least it's a signal of parallel. No, you're, you're completely right. You're completely right. And this change is now long enough ago that we'd expect the housing prices to absorb some of it. I'm surprised that this paper hasn't yet been written, particularly Parag, who has the school choice data, also writes on the housing market in independent work. So I, ha I have some evidence to suspect that someone is currently writing this paper, but hasn't been written yet. Certainly seems like a very natural exercise to do. Lots of people, you know, lots of that data is public, right? You, know, you, can, you can find out what the housing prices in Boston are. You guys should think about it. OK. Very quickly, not going to belabor this. Cadet branch matching has the same structure, as I said. So we, again, have these different uh, priorities across slots. So what do we do? Right, we're doing matching where the priorities vary across slots, and they might vary in weird ways. Right? So cadet branch match you could think of as like a type of student aid or something. You know, it would be the same as if I made it so that down here, you know, the minorities were allowed to bid that they'd take less financial aid to come to the school or something like that. Well, so what we put together in this paper is a very general framework for these, all of these applications. I mentioned there was this sort of weird technical thing going on yesterday in cadet branch matching. This technical condition called substitutability, which we're almost not going to mention. I think I may not mention it all after this slide today. But there's this very important technical condition for most of matching theory that doesn't hold. So there's sort of some reason why this is technically fascinating to me. But also, again, sort of for this very general domain that encompasses all of these applications that were already in practice before any of us looked at them. So the Chicago story the current Boston uh, student optimal stable mechanism with walk zones, and cadet branch matching. We're going to show in all of these settings the, uh, the standard student optimal stable mechanism, or rather, sorry, the cumulative offer process. There aren't necessarily student optimal stable outcomes in this world either. The cumulative offer process is going to be stable and strategy proof and improvement respecting. So the takeaway here, you know, yesterday remember that wanted sign, you know, wanted Boston for disenfranchising students. The takeaway yesterday, one of the big ones was that the Boston mechanism really doesn't work. The takeaway mechanism today is that, or the takeaway for this part of today is that generalized deferred acceptance is going to work in huge classes of models. And it's going to work in lots of settings where people were using it before knowing with certainty that it actually would work. Heartening, perhaps. Um, OK. So we're going to go, we're going to set up a model very quickly. I'm going to put a couple theorems on the board. And then we're going to call. This is not you know, a major theory seminar. Uh, then we're going to come back to the Chicago example. And we're going to talk about unbiased mechanisms. Right, so the main reason I'm working you through the model is I want to show you the foundations that we use to propose an unbiased mechanism for the Chicago problem. And having some understanding of how the model works is going to be, I think, a prerequisite. You guys can yell at me afterwards if that turns out to not be true. Yeah. Yes. I'll, well, I can, I can give you the definition heuristically right now, right? Well, I can give it to you in the same level of precision, but not with an explanation of how it actually works. So we had two biases, right? Actually, I'm close enough. I can just go back to the slide. So we have two different biases. So this, the Chicago mechanism is biased in favor of the minorities. The Boston mechanism is biased against the minorities. We're here, those are the students who live in the walk zone. What we'd like to do is sort of find something that's in between these two. That's not the extreme of putting all the open slots at the top or all the open slots at the bottom. That somehow spreads the amount of leg up you're giving through open slots relative to reserve slots equally across the mechanism. Exactly. 
this is exactly what we're going to do. So Peter's saying we should think about removing the bias as creating a lot of open, you know, a lot of little open schools, a lot of little reserve schools, and trying to spread them evenly. That's exactly what I'm about to give you the tools to do. Correct. Okay. So here's where the notation changes. So the reason we use this notation and terminology is because we're living in a branch of the literature, pun not intended, that has talked about agents and branches, so cadets and branches, things like that, rather than students and schools. So we're going to say agents and we're going to say branches, but agents for the purposes of thinking about affirmative action are going to be students and branches are going to be schools. The big distinction, and again the reason for having a separate term, is that throughout school choice we're just interested in the assignment. Here we might be interested in other components of the assignment, like who's going to get individual financial aid contracts or named fellowships or whatever. Okay? Incidentally, I'd love ex post feedback on whether this terminology choice is good. We've gotten, so I've given a number of seminars or mini talks in which I've discussed this, and the current survey is trending around 75% like sticking with agents and branches, but you know, there's 25% that's unhappy, so be useful to hear from you guys. Since you are the ones who, you know, one day will actually, you know, I hope be using this sort of stuff to fix mechanisms. I hope I will as well, but like, you know, the, you know, the probability of people who are like really serious, you know, specifically, you know, inequality in school and, and, and education scholars actually getting an opportunity to do this relative to me is probably pretty high, actually. Um, okay, anyhow, so not to mention the fact that I wrote the paper so I know what it says and I can change the notation in my head, but like you guys, if you actually want to work with stuff on this, you know, maybe can't do that quite as quickly. Anyhow, so agents are going to contract with branches. Branches have slots. So this is this disaggregation that Peter was getting at. We're going to break everything down to the slot level, and every slot will have in principle its own priority order. Okay? And each slot can hold at most one contract. So they're going to be a bunch of different positions at a school. Each one can have one student with one like possible financial aid negotiation, something like that. And we're going to fill the slot sequentially according to a precedence order. So we're going to impose one of these tie breaks. You know, either you like filling the open slots first, you like filling the reserve slots first, you like filling the, the open slots for people with, and then the reserve slots for people with red hair, and then some more open slots, something like that. Okay? Let's put that in notation. Set of agents, set of branches, a set X of contracts. So contracts are going to specify an agent and a branch and some terms of exchange. Agents, as before, they just have preferences over contracts. Contracts used to be just school assignments. Now they might be school assignments with costs of going to school. And without loss of generality, we'll assume they only care about contracts that specify them as the participants. Choice, this is one of the reasons to stick with this notation. So we need a notation for choice functions. We're going to use C, which again, I apologize, was in all of the rest of the school choice literature is used for the set of schools. Yeah, two thirds of the school choice literature. I did change some other people's notation in yesterday's slides. And then every branch has a set of slots. There's an order of slot precedence. So this says I like filling. This slot, sorry, this slot before this slot before this slot before this one in this other group and so forth. And every slot is going to have its own priority order, pi s. And the slots have priorities over the branches contracts. So remember what was going on here, the students were indifferent about which of these slots they landed in. So they were just applying to have specific contracts with the school, contracts, assignments with the school. But the school cared about which slots the students were ending up in. So that's what this is capturing. OK? Mm -hmm. Eek. That didn't work. Apologies. Sorry, I have a bunch of uh, hyperlinks throughout this, but apparently that one's broken. Quickly, an example of how this works. So two slots, this is not a real life size problem. Three potential contracts, Y, X, and Z. So if you just have access to X and Z as a branch, you fill going down, slot one, then slot two. So you just take X. 
if you now gain access to y, you take y for the first slot, and now you'll take x in the second. So note that here, x and z were both available. And in principle, you have two different slots which can hold x and only one that holds z. But this tie breaking, this precedence order, is imposing that you have to take x first. Okay. Here, as soon as slot 1 is satisfied without x, slot 2 gets to take it. So that's what this precedence order is doing. That's what choice on the branch side looks like. Uh, not going to belabor this too much. This, this generalizes a lot of different pieces of the school choice literature, including most of the ones we've seen. So this Hoffler, Yenmez, and Yildrim, all this quota material. Also absorb, or generalizes cadet branch matching. Fine. Stability, last stability definition for the day. The reason this is going on the board is because this is how people write stability in current papers in this literature. Like all of, yeah, most of market design matching. People write it like this rather than in the forms you've been seeing it before. So individual rationality just means you choose what you're assigned. So why sub i, your assignment. Same, similarly, the branch chooses what's its, what it's assigned. Unblockedness, so this is the one that people now write completely differently. There's no set, so this is a blocking group, new set of contracts, such that if you get together, you all choose this set out of all of the options available from the old options and the new ones. So everyone in the blocking coalition wants to take the blocking contracts, possibly keeping some of their old contracts or discarding them. So I know this is going by quickly. Can you guys see how this is the same definition we had before, just rephrased in choice language? Seeing enough nods that I'm going to click the slide forward. Good. OK. Deferred acceptance. The student optimal stable mechanism generalized to this world. It's not necessarily student optimal anymore. We won't actually have time to see that in detail. But the story is one agent is going to propose her first choice contract. That's going to be called the set, you know, going to now become available. And a branch is always going to be allowed to take any contracts that have ever been available. So we're not going to have this rejection anymore in the same way. We're just going to have sort of holding and not holding others. So as before, we're not going to finalize the assignment until the end of the algorithm. But now we're also not going to reject people. We're going to allow anyone whose contracts are not being held to propose. And a branch, if they want, might come back and take something that was being held before and then later not being held. So in future rounds, any agent for whom no contract is being held proposes a contract which has not yet been, oh, sorry, I used the word reject here, which is not being held, sorry, which has not yet been proposed and not held. We add that to the available set. And each time the branch holds their best set of available contracts. OK. What's a contract in the setting? A contract in the setting is a pair. You know, it's, it's a, a plan with an agent. You know, so it's you're, you're going to match to me with other terms, possibly. So it might be you're going to match to me with this fellowship. Oh, I see. OK. OK? Everyone got that? So the contract set we had is x. It's some subset of i cross b cross t. So t is these terms. You know, that's, the, uh, you know, that's the fellowships or the you know, extra research assistance or something like that. So are you going to talk about how, how are you getting this priority program to the schools? Like, do they actually give you priority orders to each of these constructed Yes. Okay. So again, so we're assuming that the priorities are exogenously given either by the schools or the school board or something like that without them being strategic players. Yes, Stephen, I'm watching the time. The cumulative offer mechanism imposes the outcome of the cumulative offer process, and the central result it's stable and strategy proof. So this looks like a standard result, sort of the result we've been seeing all over the place throughout this, uh, this sequence of talk. It turns out to actually be non-standard. We have to go through a fairly complicated st set of steps to get there. The reason being that usually there's alignment of interest among the agents. In these markets, there aren't. You can sort of think about it as the agents are fighting over the fellowships, even if they're not fighting over the seats of the school. And sometimes the school want, really wanting to give away certain fellowships might cause it to be the case that you have some agents getting them who would, wouldn't get them in the outcome of the cumulative offer process. 
But nevertheless, we can sort of build a different matching market. And here, you have to do some theory lifting. We show that the cumulative offer process outcome is actually the same as running the student optimal stable mechanism in a different market, sort of a, an imaginary market where we fully disaggregate the slots. This tells us that the proposal order doesn't affect the outcome. So I just said, you know, some student proposes. It turns out not to matter which one. And we get that the cumulative offer mechanism is stable and strategy proof. OK. So show a bunch of other things. So stable and strategy proof, independent of the proposal order, selects an agent optimal stable outcome when they exist. So unlike that result that said you can't select the Pareto optimal and stable one when they exist, we can actually show that here the cumulative offer process does select agent optimal stable outcomes if they are there. So there's another reason to propose it ex ante, to prefer it ex ante. And then respects improvements. This lets us rederive some of these Hoffler, Yen, Mez, and Yildirim results. But it also, and this is where I want to go right now, lets us look at an unbiased mechanism for Chicago school choice. So what does an unbiased mechanism look like here? So Peter called it early. We're going to cut up all the schools into a number of different slots. And then we're going to have some open slots, some reserve slots, some open slots, some reserve slots. If you want to be completely unbiased, what you really want to do is randomize them. We erred on the side of figuring that determinism is better for the research component, at least just for showing, you know, because it's completely reproducible. Also seems likely that the school boards might prefer to have something that's deterministic order rather than having this precedence order be more randomized because it's easier to explain to the parents what the order is. So we simulate it where we break them down to as much as you can. So there, there are clumps of four reserve slots with the associated either two or three open slots. And then we replicate this block throughout the school. And we give the minorities as much of a leg up as possible. So if this doesn't quite add up to the right number, we put the extra slots as open slots at the top. And what do we get? Well, what does this table show? So here's the intermediate mechanism. This is the outcomes under this unbiased mechanism. And here's how much we change if we move to the open slots all at the bottom. Okay, this is the one that's worst for the minority, or for bad for the minorities in this class, right? For the tier one students, these are basically the same. So the unbiased mechanism, you might ex ante think was going to land you in the middle. But in fact, it lands you in this position where the tier one students end up, end up you know, as badly off as if we put all the open slots at the bottom. So in some sense, this means that the Chicago mechanism is very biased in favor of the tier one students. Again, this is in the direction that Chicago wants, but it's a lot. Why is this? Well, it turns out that the test scores are very heterogeneous. So the highest scoring tier one students are still really low scoring relative to the population. And so if you fill some open slots, those go to tier four students, tier four and three. Then you take the top tier one students and give them reserves. Well, now the next highest scoring students remaining are all tier, you know, the upper tiers. And you repeat this process. And so it's basically doing the same thing. And you can see all of the motion is actually going on at the upper tiers. You know, there's some trading between tiers four and three and two, but the tier one students look as bad under this as they did with the open slots last. All right, so that's slot-specific priorities. So this, is, this is a fairly flexible framework to build these mechanisms. I don't claim it's the be-all, end-all, but it's nicely designed to try and fit within the scope of what their algorithms are currently doing and simultaneously allow them to remove some of the biases they have to the greatest extent you can in a finite market. So it would be perfectly unbiased to do what we just did in a continuum size market. None of them are actually that big for some reason. Last couple of minutes, let's just see where we went. So we're going to do the who, what, where, when, and how, and why. Did I do that? Yes. Uh, out of order, but that's OK. So what is market design? You've seen this slide now. This is the third time, I think. Application of economic principles and game theory to the design and redesign of market institutions. If you got nothing from this series, please remember that fact. OK, good. Why do we do this? Well, because a lot of these things are hard. So we face all these impossibility theorems. Markets can't always find sort of the perfect ideal mechanism on their own, because sometimes it just doesn't exist. So it's hard to think about how you balance fairness, efficiency, and incentives. And market design gives us tools to think about these trade-offs more intelligently. OK. 
What does it have to do with inequality? It's about reducing frictions and ensuring access and possibly more, you know, just information. You know, the Kojima and Hafeliu Yenmiz Yildirim sort of, and to some extent also this, uh, this Chicago stuff, simple changes in your mechanism can actually have serious welfare consequences that you don't notice unless you sit down and try and really work them out. Think about them like an engineer would. Where is it effective? So one of the reasons we've talked a lot about school choice, much of the work that's been done has been in school choice. Why has most of the work been done in school choice? Well, it's a very self-contained problem. Well, anyway, to a first order, it's a very self-contained problem. Just the choice problem is self-contained. What this does to outcomes, not so much. But it's a very self-contained problem where you can understand all the moving parts, and there's usually one political body that controls it. Thus far, market design has mostly worked on self-control problems, self-contained problems. We've worked on school choice. We've worked in the medical match, some work on cadet branch matching, spectrum auctions, eBay in some sense is market design. But it's in markets where you can sort of grip the entire problem. I think one place market design needs to move is towards sort of bigger worldview. And that's part of what's been going on in the current state of the school choice literature with school improvement and growth and so forth. But you know, we need more of this. Thus far, it's been in very closed, contained environments. And then finally, you know, who should practice market design? I hope that some of you will. QED.